So the, the fundamentals of running, 10 concepts that will help you run faster this year. Now, let's be honest. This is just my list of 10 things. If you went to a different camp and talked to a different coach, you'd probably get 10, 10, 10 other things. Um, hopefully, my list, it, it falls really close to what you and your coach do back home. Okay? One of my biggest concerns about camp is trying to tell people, hey, you know, I think you should be doing A, B, and C in training, and then going home and your coach says, no, you should do D, E, and F. But I think these things are so, so general and so fundamental to running that all good training programs will have these in there. But before we start talking about training, I want this uh, quick thought. This is, uh, anybody speak Japanese in here? No, we had a dude last week who spoke Japanese. That if so, he can pronounce this name. But, uh, Suzuki Roshi is what name this guy goes by. And this is something he, he had in one of his books. He said, our tendency is to be interested in something that is growing in the garden, not in the bare soil itself. But if you want to have a good harvest, the most important thing is to make the soil rich and cultivate it well. Okay? So I think what we could do is we could, and that's from a book called uh, Not Always So. So if we take that statement from that book and we kind of paraphrase it for coaches and athletes, our tendency is to be interested in the workouts, not the science that underlies the workouts. But if you want to run well, it's important to understand the physiology underlying the workouts. The, the, the human body reacts in similar ways for whether you're you know, a guy who can run 408 in the mile or you're a woman who runs seven minutes in the mile. Okay? There, there's just certain ways that the human body responds to training. And so what we want to talk about here are those kind of elemental things, those fundamental things. So the first one is the general adaptation syndrome. And uh, this is a nice looking man here, holding a rat. Okay? His name is Hans Selye. Some people call him the father of stress. But stress, in his mind, is the non-specific response of the body to any demand. Now he didn't say stress was waking up late, trying to get to camp. Where, where are those guys that woke up at 12.30 Mountain Time? Okay, you guys each get a pair of socks. Let's give them a hand. They woke up super early. All right, now I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to pick on you guys for a second. As I list these out, you got to shout out what these non-specific uh, responses of the body are. Ready? Call it out up there. Wait, I can't see that far. I'm oh, you can. <laughs> okay, I'll do it for you. How about that? What? Can you see it? Can you call it out? Car wreck. Car wreck. Then what? Cross country workout. Then what? Paper cut. A paper cut. How different are those things, right? A car wreck versus a, a, a paper cut. But on the cellular level, your body doesn't know the difference really between you doing a cross country workout, you getting a paper cut, or let's, I mean, we would hate for this to happen, but something traumatic like, like, like a car wreck. The, the body works in this way that at the cellular level, it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate from these types of, of, of stresses. And so the general adaptation syndrome, part of it is understanding that the body really doesn't know the, the difference you know, between these little things like a paper cut or something big like a car wreck. So let's make a graph here and let's put time on the bottom. We got this dotted line here and we're going to draw this curve, okay? It's this, it sweeps down and it sweeps up. The first thing we're gonna put up here is a workout. Now this is the point of the workout. This is when, let's say, you go for a long run. Let's say you go for a 10 mile run, okay? At some point, this is kind of your, how you're feeling, this dotted line here. We'll be a little more specific in a moment. But at some point, your body is, is, is not recovered. And so this is post-workout athlete not fully recovered. That's this whole area, this dip down area in there. Then at some point you are recovered, and that's um, noted by this blue line. And Hans Selye would call this supercompensation. Supercompensation is when you do something stressful to the body, do something that's intense, you rest the body for a while, then the body adapts to that. So here's what's cool. We've got three arrows up here, a yellow, an orange, and a red. And you can work out at any of those times. So post-workout, the athlete is fully recovered and ready for the next training stimulus. Okay, we'll look at that for a second. And this has to be somebody who hasn't been at camp before. Somebody guess what's probably the most, the, the perfect place to do the next workout. Yes, you, you were about to raise your hand. Uh, the orange one. The orange one. That's awesome. What's your name? Kevin. Kevin. You win. Okay. <laughs> Kevin, why? Oh, you already have socks, dude. <laughs> you got a twin brother. Yeah. If you have a twin brother here and you get two pairs of socks, then I guess it works out. Okay, well, why, why did you say the orange one? 
recovered. You'd be the most recovered there. What he's saying is you're the most recovered at the top of this curve. Now right here, is this still a decent place to work out? Yeah. And if you waited longer, is it still a good time to work out? Yes, but we're saying the ideal place is at the top of that curve. Okay, so that so, so are there any, any questions about this this uh, this idea? Okay. So the question is, when should you work out again? And we answered it with the at the orange um, orange dotted arrow. So now here's the same curve, and now we're going to say this is your original level of fitness. Anybody heard the word homeostasis? Raise your hand. That's basically homeostasis. Okay, that's what this dotted line is. But in here, it's, is homeostasis kind of boring? Yes. Let's talk about fitness instead. Same general concept. So here's a curve, and then there's another curve because, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name already. Kevin. What Kevin told us to do is start the next workout here. Kevin, does the shape of the curve ever change? No. no. The, sh the shape of the curve, this idea that it's going to dip down after a workout and then have super compensation, stays the same. So you've got one there, one there, and a red one there. Now, has your fitness changed after you've done three more workouts? Yeah, you got this new blue line. And if you get rid of the workouts in between, here was your original level of fitness, and after the fourth workout, here's your new level of fitness. Okay? This graph is the goal of training. This graph really is all we're trying to do. Like at camp this week, we're going to have you do a fartlek workout on Friday. We're going to let you rest on Saturday. Hopefully that super compensation starts to happen. And then we'll let you do a long run on Sunday. And that's all you're trying to do. You're doing something stressful to the body. You're resting a little bit. Then you're doing something hard a few days later. And slowly but surely, you, you gain fitness. Now the problem is, if you do a workout down at where that yellow arrow is, if the next workout the athlete isn't fully recovered but is asked to do a workout, the curve is going to stay the exact same. Where's the line going to be, above or below? The new line is down here. Because if you, if you work out down here, this curve stays the same, and the, the, the line relative to the curve has to be lower. OK, this is not a good idea. This is a tired athlete. Um, the new fitness level, this means the athlete's tired. So how long do you wait until the next workout? So let's say day zero, one, two, three, four. The reason we say day zero is that's what scientists say. But let's actually instead put it in actual days of the week. So we'll say, is there any difference on the cellular level between a workout or a race? No. Body, body's the, the body's going to think of it as a stress. So here's a Saturday race. The curve dips down a little bit. Here's Sunday. Now you're feeling better Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. OK. Now here's the deal. Remember that I've just kind of made up this time continuum. And unfortunately, the recovery, let me go back to that. Unfortunately, the recovery is going to be different from athlete to athlete. And this is, this is really important, that, that the amount of recovery that athletes need will vary. And it will vary on your training age. How, how many people in here have been training seriously for, for, for three years or more? Okay. How many people, raise your hand, don't be embarrassed if this is your first year of training seriously. Raise your hand. Some of you guys from Lincoln, some other people. Perfect. So if you've been training seriously for three years, we'll say your training age is three. You might be 16 years old. You might be 14 years old. That, that, that's your chronological age. In here, we don't care as much about your chronological age as we do your training age. So keep that in the back of your mind. As your training age goes up, the more workouts you can do in a week or in a month, the, the, the more you can handle hard workouts. So let, let's do this. Let's spread this out over. Um, let's spread this out over a two-week period. And I'm sorry, my, my letters got a little screwed up here. But we're going to keep doing a workout. This is supposed to be Sunday. Then take sat so I'm sorry, workout Saturday or race Saturday. Take off Sunday. Do a workout Monday. Take off Tuesday. Then we're going to do a workout again Wednesday. Take off Thursday. Do a workout Friday. And then we have to take off both Saturday and Sunday because we couldn't do a workout Sunday because you know your state won't allow it. So then that, there's that next curve here, doing a workout on Monday. And then we're doing a workout again on Wednesday. So here's the workouts. Over a two-week period, how many workouts? Six. You can just shout it out. Six. Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday. OK, those are the yellow curves. I want to show you something I like a little bit better. We'll start with the Saturday race. 
but we'll say now you don't work out till Tuesday, you rest Wednesday, Thursday, then you don't work out till Friday, you rest Saturday, Sunday, then you don't work out till Monday, you rest Wednesday, or, I'm sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, then you go again Thursday. How many total workout days in the orange? Five. So in, so in a two-week period, this is the, like the first place in the, in, the, in the presentation where you and your coach have to make a choice. Do you want to squeeze in six workouts in two weeks, or do you only want to do five workouts in two weeks? And it's this philosophic question. Do you err on the side of too many training days or too few? In my opinion, high school athletes should err on the side of fewer training days rather than more training days. And, and, and again, please consult with your coach when you get back home. Because I think that everybody's, you know, there, there's a lot of valid answers to this question. But I think that too often we see people trying to squeeze in all these workouts and then they just end up tired.